Hello, everybody. So great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm Glenn Ruga, the founder and director of the Social Documentary Network. And it's always so great to see so many faces here, um, both familiar and new from so many parts of the world. Um, in, in prior discussions this past two weeks, I've listed all the names of countries where people are from, but I'll dispense with that. But I could just say that there are people from all over the world in this meeting, which is so great to see. And th this is a third of many events we have planned for the SDN 2024 Visual Storytelling Festival. And tonight, we're so grateful to have with us here today, Stephen Hart, Michael Christopher Brown, Lauren Walsh, and Fred Richin to talk about the impact of generative AI in the future, in the future of visual storytelling. This is definitely a hot button topic. We have more people registered for this event tonight than any of the events that we're doing during the entire festival. And I guess we're all trying to figure out what's going on with AI and what it means for us and into the future. There are a lot of new faces here today. So I'd like to say a few words about the Social Documentary Network and the uh, Visual Storytelling Festival. Um, SDN was founded in 2008 as a platform for documentary photographers to create online galleries of their projects to present to a global audience. And to this day, this is still a core part of what we do. And I encourage any documentary photographers out there to consider using the SDN platform to showcase your projects. In the 16 years since our founding, we've also launched a digital and print magazine, Zeek, to showcase the best work from the SDN platform. And other programs include our speaker series, which we refer to as Documentary Matters and of which this program tonight is part of. We also have a very dynamic education program with two upcoming in-person classes in the Boston area um, coming up soon. And each year we present the Zeke Award for Documentary Photography, and we'll be exhibiting this year's award recipients at both the Bridge Gallery in Cambridge, Massachusetts with an opening on April 13th, and at, the photo, at Photoville in Brooklyn with an opening on June 1st. And I hope you can join us at one of these programs if you're in either of these cities. And one of our newest programs is the SDN Portfolio Reviews, which is um, this year on Saturday, April 20th. These are online portfolio review sessions with industry leaders in editorial, publishing, and fine art, where you, where you will receive professional level feedback on your photography and also possibly opportunities to publish or exhibit your work. Um, this is the first year we're doing the SDN Visual Storytelling Festival, which is a virtual and in-person festival that continues into May, providing a structure for seven panel discussions such as this, five classes and workshops, the portfolio reviews, and two exhibitions. And you can learn more about, um, more about these programs on the SDN website at socialdocumentary.net or zekemagazine.com. Tonight, I'd like to welcome all SDN more board members and advisory committee members who are here with us today. We'll have a Q&A towards the end of tonight's program. And if you have questions, either put them in the chat or raise your digital hand. We won't be able to get to them all, but we'll do our best. And we'd really like to hear from you. And before I turn this over to our moderator, I'd like to welcome Andrea Zaki from Digital Silver Imaging to say a few words. DSI is an outstanding digital photo lab in Belmont, Massachusetts, and is a sponsor for the entire festival. Andrea? Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for putting on such fantastic programming in the festival. Um, I've really enjoyed it, and uh, you've really done a lot for the photo community. And uh, I just ask everyone in the audience to support SDN in any way you can. Uh, by subscribing to Zeke or a magazine. And I also ask you to support the institutions that support you as photographers. So um, at that point, I'd just like to turn it back over to Glenn and say thank you for the excellent programming. And I'm really looking forward to the topic. Oh, thank you, Andrea. And thank you so much for your support. The moderator for tonight's program is Fred Richin. Many of you are familiar with Fred. He's an outstanding photo editor, writer, educator, and most known as a thought leader in the field of photography, and especially how it affects our understanding or often our misunderstanding of the world. Fred is Dean Emeritus of the International Center of Photography, where he founded the photojournalism documentary photography program in 1983. Mm -hmm. 
He was also professor of photography and imaging at New York University for over two decades. Richin served as picture editor of the New York Times Magazine from 1978 to 1982 and executive editor of Camera Arts Magazine. He created the first multimedia version of the New York Times newspaper in 1994 and then conceived and edited the Times' first nonlinear online documentary project, Bosnia, Uncertain Path to Peace, nominated in 1997 for a Pulitzer Prize in public service. Gives me pl great pleasure to turn this over to Fred Richen. Okay. So from one rectangle to all the others, uh, good evening, or wherever you are in the world. And I, I'm just going to give kind of a brief introduction to some of the issues. And in fact, I just finished writing a book on this uh, two days ago. So it's, it's, it's kind of fresh. So I'm going to show you some slides. A lot of my concern is really there's something like 53 elections going on around the world, major elections, and there's a lot of concern about the future of democracy when people will not be able to differentiate, you know, whether medium, photography, video, text is synthesized, fabricated, or, you know, coming out of a lens as something that actually happened. So I'm going to share my screen and, you know, and then we'll hear from from everybody else as well. Okay. So I, I've been working a lot with generating imagery uh, using different AI systems. You know, those of you who have done it know what I'm talking about. It usually takes a few seconds at this point. So I gave a prompt for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris at the beach. And I got this about 20 seconds later. This, this was the day after the big headline was none of the big AI systems will allow these kinds of images to be made because of the elections. So what I've been doing is playing with it and trying to figure out, you know, what it allows me to do and not to do, you know, Putin and you know, Swift and and, uh, you know, the bottom left is two billionaires together. And the problem is that once you start seeing synthetic imaging, you don't know whether actual photographs are real or not. And what happens is the poisoning of the well. You, 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 you know, my experience now is I'm skeptical of almost all imagery that I see uh, on news sites as well. You know, only one of these four images is an actual photograph, but it really doesn't matter at that point. Is you know, the, it, 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 you just do what you want and. You know, this is the image of Joe Biden bound on the back of the truck in Long Island that ran January 28th on Trump's Truth Social. And we're going to be seeing a lot of these kinds of images. This was part of a video that are really very, very easy to make. The stuff that I do could be done by a 14 year old, you know, just putting in a text prompt. So one of the concerns I have as well is history. This is the uh, ticker tape parade uh, welcoming the troops back from the Vietnam War, which of course never happened. But as I make many of these images, you know, going back with historical events and distorting them, if I start putting them online and the AI systems train on them, you could start to be able to prove anything you want to prove. Um, I've done some really awful things with it. And you can also buy synthetic images now online. Adobe, for example, is selling an image of a street protest capturing, quote unquote, the authentic emotions in Ukraine. You know, soldier, a dynamic shot, again, of the uh, authenticity of what's going on in Ukraine. Publications are buying these, they're running them. They're supposed to do it without being misleading, but there's really no enforcement for it. So there's been a problem, including in Gaza at this point, of a lot of, you know, there are now thousands of synthetic images, Gaza, Ukraine, and elsewhere, that people can do from their living room, their office, anywhere in the world, distorting in any way they want or making up in any way they want whatever is happening in the world without having been there. You know, somebody in the news photography business said to me the other day, maybe in the future, it's too dangerous will just actually do text prompts and make the images without having to send a photographer. It's also a lot cheaper. 
So I started writing this in 19, about this in 1984 for the New York Times Magazine when it was six years before Photoshop. And then I wrote that we may have to rely on the image maker and not the image to tell us into which categories certain pictures fall. This was 40 years ago. I'm showing you this basically to say this is not new. We've known this is coming. As an industry, we've done almost nothing to prevent it, to constrain it legally, government, in terms of uh, journalistic uh, organizations, and it's happened. So as we know, you know, to me, I, I start this process not with AI, but in 1982 with the National Geographic, the now famous cover, where they had to rotate the pyramid on the left to get it more behind the pyramid on the right to fit into a vertical cover. And when I interviewed the editor in chief in 1984, he told me on the phone that all we did was really establish a new point of view as if the photographer was retroactively moved a few feet to one side. I actually hung up the phone, called him back, and I said, did you really say that? He said he did. So this goes back 42 years. Again, it's like climate change. It's very hard to say that we didn't know that this was coming. When Photoshop came out in 1990, I was on the Today Show with the art director from Photoshop when he announced it to the United States. And you know, he put himself, Russell Brown, in a photograph of Reagan and Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan with the American flag using Photoshop, showing the audience what could be done. He prefaced it by saying, I am now going to do the most unethical thing. And he did. I had just come out with this book in 1990, same year, warning against this kind of stuff, because this was the year before, in 1989, when the Chinese government said no massacre occurred, but the photograph was able to, to triumph over the, the government and say, it, in fact, it did occur. This is no longer possible, for the most part, in media. It's very, we, we don't know what's happening in Gaza. We don't know what's happening in Ukraine. There's no iconic imagery anymore, and there hasn't been for, for quite a number of years. So just to, to end up with a couple of ideas, um, you know, this is the famous Tank Man photograph from, from Tiananmen Square in China. Nobody knows the guy's name. He's anonymous. He disappeared. This is known as one of the great images of, you know, really of resistance, of standing up to an autocratic government. Um, but when you searched it on Google a few weeks ago, this is the first image that came up. This is synthetic. It's from Reddit. This is the tank man. When you search the word tank man, this is what came up. And when I did the search, it was now number six. But again, this anonymous guy that we don't know who he was now has a face which is fabricated, which is false. And then Google on top of it announced that soon it will begin fabricating images when you search for them rather than finding them, which then opens up an enormous can of worms in terms of what you want the world to look like as an assault on the credibility of witnessing in the photograph. So this is a campaign I led in 1994 to put a Nautilus icon on heavily retouched photographs. It really didn't go anywhere. Picture editors said it wasn't necessary. You know, this is a synthetic image I made of a Holocaust survivor. Do we have to label it with AI now so people will know? You know, what do we need to do? And with a group of people, this is the last slide from World Press Photo, National Press Photographers, Magnum, and others. We started a movement, Writing with Light, www.light.org, in which what we do is we favor the photographer as the author of the image, just like a writer, we no longer trust the camera. So if you trust the integrity of the photographer, their code of ethics, it's similar to what, you know, writing with light, it's, it's like a writer. And then, you know, a couple of us, three of us came up with the definition of nonfiction photography as a recording of the visible in which the photographer strives to represent actualities, events, people, etc., in a fair and accurate manner with appropriate context. So Writing with Light is a group trying to support nonfiction photography through the integrity of the author. So I'm going to stop sharing. And that was just meant as an introduction.
uh, you know, and we'll be talking about these issues as we go through the three speakers. And then afterwards, we'll, you know, there'll be time for questions, thoughts, comments, and so on. So the first speaker is Stephen Hart, who started his career as a newspaper photographer while studying math and computer engineering, including artificial intelligence at Boston University. He's worked at UPI, the Associated Press, and Hearst Magazines, and is currently a principal in the customer success organization with Adobe Systems focusing on higher education. So Stephen, it's up to you. <laughs> I'm gonna fix the problems of the world. Thank you, Fred. Uh, and thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you all. So just a, just a, a, a little bit of more about my background and, and, and where I believe uh, photojournalism, well, well, how dear it is to me. I wanna, sh I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show a couple of things on my screen in a moment, but uh, one of, the, one of the, my favorite possessions is this photograph. Uh, that is an original print from the original negative and signed by Joe Rosenthal. And uh, un this is arguably, according to Hal Buell, the late, the late Hal Buell, the, the former director of uh, photos at the Associated Press, who I worked for, arguably the most famous photojournalistic photo ever made. Uh, th that picture in and of itself was uh, a, a subject of potential fabrication. We know it was actually real. We know that that happened in front of the camera that Joe was in front uh, behind, but it was uh, accused to have been fabricated, to have been set up. Nothing digital, nothing nothing uh, fancy in the dark room. Uh, and this all came about because of a second picture that it made because the the leading uh, military person on the ground wanted a different flag raised in a different group. So that's that's reality. Uh, and then uh, let me sh now share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, can some uh, Lauren? Can you give me a thumbs up? You see my screen? Just okay. Thanks. So uh, and this is of course not what I wanted to show. Here we go. Uh, so the interesting th thing that Fred pointed out, uh, we, we, we came upon these presentations and these visuals completely separate. Uh, and and, the, and the, the picture that was the first one that in my head, actually for two, you see the one below there, that affected me from a journalistic perspective when, when I was a young photo editor and photographer at UPI at Boston Herald, uh, and uh, the AP was this one at uh, National Geographic. And in doing research about this, uh, I, I, well, when it came out, I thought I was offended. Like probably all of us were in the eighties when this came, it was like, oh my gosh, how can this, this uh, uh, publication that it holds photojournalism up above many uh, corrupt an image to be put on the front of the cover? Well, one of the things that's interesting is while this was digitally altered, and at the time, the verb wasn't photoshopped, at the time, the verb was cytext, if you recall, because that was the big $50,000 machine that did this. Well, while National Geographic defended the cover for, for whatever reasons, what also is about this picture is that Gordon, the photographer, paid these camel riders to go back and forth in front of the in front of the. Uh, pyramids in order to make the picture. So where does the fabrication lie? I am not excusing what the editors and the creatives in terms did for the cover. I am equally not excusing in terms of what occurred before the picture was actually made and captured. They're the same in, in my book, right? Uh, uh, what Rick, Rick Smolin done when in the 1986 gathered uh, 200 photojournalists, many, I'm sure the people who are attending this call uh, know, or there might actually be a couple of people who contributed to the book. This cover was fabricated via, uh, or, or manipulated, I should say, via a side text. Uh, I personally think that is not an appropriate way to, to, to promote this book. 
Rick defends it. Uh, I, I think it's not defensible, but that's just me. Now, I want to point out that I have been working for Adobe Systems off and on since 2000. I left in 2004, went to work for Hearst Magazines, and I ran editorial and production technologies there uh, for four and a half years. Now, this was a bunch of fashion magazines. During that period of time, uh, uh, Red Book was taken down by the, the uh, website Jezebel for the uh, Photoshop alt alteration of Faith Hill. And I didn't put this in this presentation, perhaps I should have, but you can find this on the, on the internet very easily by Googling Red Book and Faith Hill, and you can see what had occurred. Jezebel put a put a ransom, uh, put a bounty uh, out there for for pictures to be submitted in terms of photoshopped, quote unquote, imagery that had covered, that was on front of the fashion magazines. It was rampant in the industry uh, in for the past three or four decades. It has become easier, uh, but it is uh, the imagery has been uh, uh, manipulated to recall. Uh, uh, Oprah's head was placed on Anne Margaret's body on the cover of uh, Time, uh, excuse me, TV Guide, among other things. There's there's a plethora of those examples. Uh, this here is uh, an example of a Reuters photographer, 2006, I believe, submitted uh, pictures. A freelance photographer submitted pictures of uh, some fighting in. Uh, um, forgive me, I'm forgetting exactly the site. I believe it was Israel in the in the West Bank. Uh, and this was a completely fabricated picture. The Reuters photographer was fired. All the images were removed from Reuters database. Uh, and in fact, uh, he had also freelanced for the Associated Press. I had, I had left the AP by that point, but the then director of photography, who's now interestingly a colleague of mine here at, at Adobe, Santiago Leon, they did an uh, investigation and they removed all the pictures that this gentleman uh, had, had made. Now, nothing is new in terms of political manipulation, in terms of news, quote unquote, news photography. Uh, uh, the top picture here is Joe McCarthy, and on the left is uh, Senator Tyson from, from Maryland. Uh, Tyson had uh, led the uh, committee that really called out McCarthy of falsely accusing uh, that there is 200 and then some communists in the State Department uh, and uh, which was a, a false false fact. It was 1950. Uh, the narrative, uh, the narrative, not the pictures. The narrative you would find would be very similar to the political climate today. Well, it pissed off uh, McCarthy so much that he fabricated this picture, or his organization fabricated this picture of Tyson alongside the leader of the American Communist Party, uh, and that was enough to uh, cause. Uh, Tyson to lose the tidings, excuse me, uh, the his his reelection campaign uh, for the Senate uh, in 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 representing the state of Maryland. So this kind of manipulation has existed for a good long time. Uh, I technology from a, 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 from an AI perspective is 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 not the evil uh, piece here. The evil piece here is the lack of education that exists and the assumption by the general public that uh, it's okay to manipulate images and what's wrong with doing that. And I'll leave you with this. So uh, we the most recent image that has caught the eye of the general populace, particularly in the States and, and somewhat in the UK, is uh, Princess Kate. Uh, and and her family uh, in that image that they released and that she unquote she was an unexperienced Photoshop user where she uh, manipulated the picture to show her and the family uh, and that was troublesome by all means that was troublesome uh, that that blew the trust that came of imagery that came out of the palace and and all that but what bothered me more. Uh, ab about that situation was what, when it came out that morning or that evening that that image had indeed been manipulated. The AP killed it, the Reuters killed, Reuters killed it, AFP killed it. 
And they were discussing this at the top of the hour, at the seven o'clock, first 30 minutes of the news program, CBS Morning, which with Gail King and, uh, and, and, and the others. Gail King said, I don't see what is so wrong with that. Tell me what is so wrong with that. Explain to me what is so wrong with manipulating that picture. That's what bothered me. Because we need to, as, a, as, as an industry, uh, as representatives of the photojournalism uh, 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 group uh, demographic, those are the people we need to educate. Because if we have a Gail King getting out there, or, or and she's an influencer of Oprah, saying, what's wrong with manipulating that picture? That's the problem. Technology is not the problem. We've got technology solutions and uh, to to address that. Oops, excuse me. Uh, but uh, that's anyway. Uh, I'll leave you with that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, where are we going from now, Fred? I assume we're going to the next speaker, which is Michael Christopher Brown. Michael has been uh, a member. A photographer at Magnum Photos, a frequent contributor to publications such as the New York Times Magazine and National Geographic, where he's worked since 2004. His work in Libya during the conflict there using a cell phone camera resulted in the book Libyan Sugar and opened up a, a, a new way of documenting conflict. And he said something I think very, very interesting, uh, quoting Michael, before I was used by photography, now I use photography. So he's gonna be talking about a project he began in 2023, uh, using synthetic imagery uh, to create the project 90 miles on the emigration of Cubans to the United States. Up to you, Michael. Okay, so uh, let's see. All right, how's that look? Full screen? Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. All right, cool. Um, hey, everyone. Yeah, so I will. So um, for those who don't know, this is um, it's, uh, a project called 90 Miles. And um, coming from the world of the documentary where most of my life I've photographed things in front of me to where I can now tell stories that, that are not limited by space and time is really exciting. And um, I received a lot of criticism over the use of AI over this, uh, this project, which was of course expected and something I hoped would um, happen so we could have more conversation around this. Um, in my work of over 25 years as a photographer, I've learned that People generally do, do not want to be voiceless, but they often want to be faceless. Um, so with this in mind, uh, one of the fundamental questions I was asking myself in making 90 miles was, can telling real world stories with the photorealistic AI generated imagery be useful? So 90 miles is an AI reportage illustration experiment exploring real realities of Cuban life, including historical events in Cuban's preparation escape crossing and arrival in Florida. Uh, the work is based on true stories, but is of course not real. Reportage illustration has, has uh, been used for over 150 years in journalistic publications, and in some way has, has been around since uh, the dawn of civilization. Reportage illustration is a kind of visual journalism. The illustrator conveys a narrative and reports a specific moment the central premise of reportage illustration is storytelling. Uh, this is uh, the, um, this like shows in the growing chaos within the Trump White House. Uh, um, AI's improvements in photorealistic quality inspired me to make 90 miles last year in the tradition of reportage illustration. Mid journey was used for creating the imagery. Um, I gathered AI prompts from years of conversations with Cubans while living in Cuba and lifelong research, really. Um, I found that prompting with the words that were more objective uh, resulted in a more 
authentic uh, looking image versus using subjective words like beautiful, which would often result in more studio commercial looking imagery. Um, these images were not modified uh, beyond their initial generations, um, as I'm not trying to hide the fact that the imagery was made with AI. So the strange hands and body parts as artifacts of the early technology, um, I wanted to sort of uh, really show that, um, that authenticity, um, even though much of it lies within this uncanny valley. Um, while working in Cuba from 2014 through 2016, I tried to photograph the stories of the Cubans who, who courageously escaped each year to the United States, mostly by homemade watercrafts of some kind. However, any coverage of the refugees escaping Cuba was risk endangering Cubans who remained in the country, such as um, friends and contacts and family. There was just no safe and ethical way for me to really um, show it, access it um, in real life, at least that I found in the way that I wanted to show it. Um, the journey of the escape I had been you know, learning about for years, watching the TV and reading newspapers growing up in America. Um, and a search on Google will show the imagery of Cubans coming ashore in Florida, mostly in homemade vessels. Um, Cubans who attempt the crossing are extremely resourceful, which, which is reflected in their rafts assembled from inner tubes, pieces of wood and plastic, household supplies, etc. This is from uh, made from oil drums and uh, metal. This is from a windsurfer, pieces of foam and a plastic chair. Um, this is an actual vehicle. I found like a number of these actually on Google. Um, and this is uh, wood shipping pallets with a shipping card and some PVC pipe. So the story of 90 miles speaks to the 90 miles of ocean separating Cuba and Florida. The story begins in the late 50s and early 60s, not long after Fidel Castro came to power and following the Bay of Pigs in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Cuba experienced dramatic change and the economy quickly deteriorated. Um, now, 60 years later, uh, lack of economic opportunity still remains arguably the largest motivator for an escape. Um, nearly a half million Cubans fled um, in the past couple of years when Cuba experienced its largest exodus since the 1980s due to an ongoing economic crisis with soaring inflation alongside shortages of food and medicine. Um, so I was inspired to make illustrations showing some of the motivations and reasons for Cubans to leave, including everyday life and politics. This is a sort of um, house adrift. These are food ration cards. This is inside a local taxi. I mean, dinner. So, Michael, earlier, the photographs you showed earlier were, were real, we assume, photojournalist images. These are now all AI-generated images that you're showing now, correct? True. These are all AI-generated, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Can you tell us what prompts you use to generate these images? A variety of prompts, really. Um, essentially, everything you see in the photographs are from words that I was using in the prompts. Um, sometimes, you know, the words I had to change because the engine wouldn't recognize the, the, the words for whatever reason. So many times when I would prompt for Cubans, I would get imagery that was imagery of, um, uh, say, Indians from the subcontinent. So, so I had to be, um, I had to sort of like use other words in order to uh, get the results I wanted sometimes. Um, healthcare in Cuba is free to Cuban residents, although challenges include minimal salaries for the doctors, poor facilities, poor, provi poor provision of equipment and the frequent absence of essential drugs. Um, this is 
you know, like a lot of these are scenes, of course, that I never actually saw um, while I was there. Uh, this is of a physician driving a cab um, uh, while I was working in Cuba. And we would hear the stories of, you know, physicians who would drive cabs and so they could make money, including my neighbor, who was a brain surgeon who, who, um, who drove a taxi and made more driving a taxi every month than he did on um, working at the hospital. So these are more images of from local hospitals, uh, you know, just hospital workers, physicians, um, emergency workers, nurses. And I, I also illustrated major historical events such as the the embassy crisis in 1980, when Cubans tried gaining asylum by um, taking refuge on the grounds of the embassies, including the Peruvian embassy, um, which, which, you know, the embassy does not look like this. Um, what I was trying to do was uh, really prompt for the the energy and emotion, and tried to connect with. Um, scenes that may have happened or like what what movement might have looked like but of course um, you know the visuals you see here uh, none of the say I generated imagery is actually as it appears right following the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s Cuba fell into a crippling economic crisis known as the special period with many citizens looking to flee the island the 1994 Malacanazo protests in Havana was the largest anti-government demonstration Cuba had seen since the Cuban Revolution. In the weeks following, Fidel allowed tens of thousands of Cubans to leave. Also, um, while the special period was going on, the Freakies, a Cuban punk subculture that originated, originated in the 1980s, were known for injecting themselves with HIV positive blood in order to qualify for the state run AIDS clinics with food and shelter. There's a film coming, coming out about this very soon called uh, Los Freakies. Um, many of them chose HIV over starvation and homelessness. I then generated imagery of Cubans preparing to escape, making watercraft that would carry them 90 miles across the ocean into Florida. There was a time in Cuba when, when you could actually make you know, your boats uh, watercraft on the streets in the open. You know, there were times that the government encouraged uh, the Cubans to leave. Um, it's what you see in the previous imagery. Um, repurposing ships and cars and all different kinds of um, mobile structures to to you know, be made into watercraft. Planning the route. I 
an imagery that may represent the escape. I think in general, I see a lot of this imagery in the way that I would see history paintings. Um, when you look at history paintings or any kind of visual art throughout the ages, what is the value of it as it relates to history, if it's commenting on history? I mean, all, really all art is, right? So, though we might see, and I've used this example many times, uh, Picasso's Guernica, is there any value in it? I mean, of course, it's worth a lot of money, but if we think about this painting as far as his, you know, in terms of history, as it, as it connects to it, what is the value of that painting? And I'm not comparing this work with his work, but I'm, that's um, how I see AI is not photography, yeah? On March 13th, 1994, 37 Cuban men, women, and children who attempted uh, to escape Cuba on a boat were drowned at sea. Uh, the Cuban Coast Guard was accused of sinking the vessel while refusing to rescue some of the passengers. Amnesty International stated there is sufficient evidence to indicate that it was an official operation and that if events occurred in the way described by several of the survivors, those who, who died as a result of the incident were victims of extrajudicial execution. The, the mid-journey engine now is much more realistic. I'm working on a project with it now where it's, you can't really tell the difference. Whereas a lot of the symmetry, um, you could really tell at least for the people who were using it, who are using it a lot. Um, and then I generated imagery so I could illustrate the crossing of the Florida Strait from Cuba to America. This is a repair of a, a helm. It's a storm. A lot of um, a lot of Cubans go lost at sea. Uh, this is illustrating a rescue by the American Coast Guard and the arrival in Florida. Uh, Goodwill uh, Receiving Center and uh, Supermarket. Um, for anyone who's been to Cuba, you, you know when you go to the market, there's often not a lot of options available. Um, so trying to show the 
reaction. And that's it. That's it. Extraordinary. Uh, there's a lot of comments in the chat, but um, you know, hold up for a larger Q and A at the end. But just one comment: um, Why did you feel the need to create these images? And after it's all said and done, what do you think about them? Um, I don't really know how I, how I feel about them. Um, I'm happy I made the imagery. I think uh, part of it was just my desire to actually make the story in real life, and I wasn't able to do it. And there's so many stories like this. I mean, there's an endless amount of stories. Within any story I work on, there's, there's really an endless amount of stories that are impossible for me to photograph for whatever reason. And uh, so, and I like photographing things. And um, I try and photograph everything that, that, that I can, that I want to. And this was, a, was something that I really tried to, to gain access to. Um, uh, and I just felt it was worth um, exploring. I mean, like my, my interest in photography uh, um, really began with, uh, with studying mythology uh, when I was at university. Um, I mean, I learned photography when I was young, but it was really mythology that, that got me into photography, you know, the power of uh, visual imagery and culture and history. And, um, and I was never, I mean, of course, working within the, the field of photojournalism from for much of my career, there's um, a lot of restrictions as it should be. And, uh, but I think that there's, there's, um, there's an opportunity to, to use, uh, use AI just as there is like um, uh, journaling or uh, painting, you know, or any of the arts as like an extension of, um, of our uh, storytelling. So, um, and also to use it, you know, to um, show, show the old stories in new ways, as ways of just bringing uh, the stories back into the conversation. And, you know, to sort of uh, challenge people and you know, their beliefs and understanding about a story. And um, yeah. Um, Fred, let me turn this back to you, but be before you introduce our last speaker, do you want to just make a quick comment on what we saw? No, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, this is Michael and I, this is our third panel together. So, you know, one of the issues is when you, depict other people you know one idea some people use with ai is you show them the images you get their approval you know it's a collaboration with the people you know are, are you being depicted in a way that you find offensive not offensive and so on and so forth you know michael's chosen to do it his way you know i'm just i always you know turn things around and ask the question for example if somebody in another country depicted the american you know, people in Boston and just decided having, you know, what people in Boston are supposed to look like and made an AI presentation that can be confused with photography. How does it feel, you know, to, to the people being depicted? So, you know, I think in the realm of graphic novel or mythology, as Michael said, you know, he, he's doing work that makes sense. It's just when it overlaps with what looks like you know more traditional photographic documentary in an age of fake news and an age of post-truth and an age where we're often confused about what's going on you know if we did that with the people of gaza is, is that correct you know th those sorts of things so th those are just you know comments to, to keep going okay all right so let me keep going then lauren <laughs> You're the last, rec last rectangle of us. Lauren Walsh is a professor at NYU and she's founder and director of the Gallatin Photojournalism Initiative, the author of Conversations on Conflict Photography and Through the Lens, the Pandemic and Black Lives Matter. And she is also the lead educator who oversaw the development of media visual literacy curricula, including focus on generative AI, 
for the Content Authenticity Initiative, which again is is Adobe, you know, and, and one of the issues I think is Adobe has introduced Content Authenticity Initiative at the same time that they're selling the synthetic images. So, you know, it becomes a little bit confusing, but, um, you know, it's up to you, Lauren. Well, with that as the intro, <laughs> um, thank you, Fred. Um, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. Um, yeah, so let me, I will share my screen. As we joked before everyone arrived, um, I am not talented at putting together nice PowerPoints. My colleagues um, are better at it. So um, I just, I think I wanna make a few points and weave together a little bit of what I've been hearing from um, the two, my two co-panelists, but also our moderator, Fred. Um, yes, so my, my background is coming at this a bit like Steve um, from a photojournalistic space and a sort of deep and abiding protection of the integrity of the photojournalistic image or what we can trust as press photography. Um, and I was, so the Content Authenticity Initiative, just to give a quick gloss is, um, as Fred was saying, it is headed up by Adobe and is a pretty large consortium of media companies, tech companies, NGOs, academic institutes, um, brought together with um, a goal of creating, um, finding a way to trace image provenance, um, often with an eye towards combating mis and disinformation. So I'm not a tech person and I'm not gonna get into the tech side of things, but essentially, what you can do is look at an image, a CAI enabled image and kind of trace what manipulations have happened to it um, or what has not happened to it. So if there is a faked image that someone is trying to announce is a real image um, with CAI enabled technology, you should be able to verify that whether it's true or not. Um, and conversely, if there is a real and by real, I mean um, an unmanipulated photographic image that someone wants to discredit, the CAI gives legitimacy to understanding, should this be discredited or not? Um, I do think Fred's point is 100% spot on that um, no one is kind of free from critique and we should be thinking through all of this. And the fact that there has been Adobe stock of gen AI images that have taken us into very, very tricky territories. Like I think you gave us the example from Israel Hamas is definitely something to think about um, and question. I also just want to point out, um, and two of the co-panelists have said this, um, this is not new. Um, Fred, I literally wrote down that you wrote, this is not, or said, this is not new. Um, and Steve, you, you did similar by way of showing us the Joe Rosenthal image, right? So whether it's a manipulation in camera, was this image set up or staged, or whether it's a manipulation in post, was it altered after the fact? or whatever we want to call now this new, is it a, a manipulation in generation, right? Is it kind of just growing from um, a large language model uh, or some other system that algorithmically creates the image for us? This isn't actually new. And maybe this come back, comes back, Steve, to your point of the evil isn't necessarily the AI. It's in understanding what it is and how to respond to it. So for my purposes, um, I was brought in to oversee the creation of media and visual literacy curricula uh, that grows from the Content Authenticity Initiative. Um, and as I said at the start, I am coming from a journalistic background. Um, so I walk in with all the same kind of skeptical, critical questions. I also feel like this is here. This is the landscape we live in. And if we don't prepare students and older uh, for how to read and respond to the changes that are happening technologically, then we're gonna be in a worse place. So that is my goal with these curricula um, and they're developed for middle school. So kind of 10 to 12 year olds, high school, uh, let's say like 13 to 17 and then higher education. So college and beyond. 
Um, and part of why I think this is very important and has resonance, um, and Fred, credit to you, you mentioned this already, but you know, we've been hearing about post-truth and fake news uh, for many years now, uh, and 2024 and the mis- and disinformation campaigns are have ramped up and will continue to ramp up because 50 plus countries are holding elections, including eight of the 10 most populous countries in the world. So I am thinking about this, not just, you know, how do we teach 10 year olds to think about generative AI, but how do we prepare them to be responsible civic participants as they grow up? Um, so I'm just gonna show a little bit from the curricula. Um, okay, so this is the, the CAI. Um, Content Authenticity Initiative, uh, Media Literacy Curriculum, and then one offshoot of, so this was developed about two years ago, and it's a broad media and visual literacy curriculum. And then in the past year, with the various updates and changes that kind of probably hit all of our radars maybe about one year ago, or a little bit less than that, with generative AI and visuals, uh, we added new components to reflect that. So, I mean, this is, I really am just giving little glimpses. Um, this is written for teachers. Um, so those of you who are not in the educational space, this is gonna look kind of boring and dry, but this is how you put together pedagogy and lesson plans. Um, so this is at the higher educational level and it's showing kind of objectives, things to do in class. There's suggested readings that get assigned to students. Um, there are some, possible assignments that you give to them. This is a long one, but I can go to the next one. Part of the way that I um, teach and which is reflected in these curricula is uh, not lecturing from a top-down perspective, but providing students with ways of thinking about things and encouraging them to be critically empowered um, respondents. So you'll see here even, you know, this question number two, this is for a college age bracket, but it asks them to think about what if you were setting the standards at your college? How would you, what would your rules be for your, and I said, you know, you're a professor of art history. They may not all be studying art history, but I wanted them to be thinking very specifically in terms of a visual space and what this would mean for teaching and thinking and learning and usage of new technologies or not usage of new technologies. So their assignment here is to add a statement to the class syllabus on, with their position on the use or not of generative AI. Um, what would you say, right? And that's just kind of getting them to think through it and how it might apply, not just out there in the world, but in their own lives. Um, one or two examples from the high school space. This, uh, and for those of you who are educators in the K through 12 space, the curricula that we developed uh, meets uh, common core state standards. So it can be moved into English classes or social studies classes or science classes. Um, and we had that specifically in mind because this is not currently, um, media literacy is not a discipline in and of itself in traditional schooling patterns. So we had to find ways to filter it through other forms or other subjects. Um, I actually think that's in many regards a better way of teaching it because media literacy isn't just about media. It isn't just about you know looking at or consuming news. It is kind of all over the place throughout our lives. Um, this is a glimpse into you know, the difference between a, a college assignment and a high school assignment, right? This has, it has the look and feel of a worksheet that you would hand out in class. And again, students are not being told what to think, they are asked to think through it. So if you look at these kind of two side-by-side -side charts here, um, they're, asked, they're asked to think about what are uh, ethical considerations, what are unethical considerations. And then middle school, it breaks it down even further. Um, but I felt strongly that this is a skill that needs to be taught from a very early age. Um, probably we could start even younger than 10 years old, but we started it with a middle school bracket and, and meeting those common core standards. So some of it is really just what is generative AI? Um, this is how we broke this down. What is it? What are some of the concerns about it? And some hands-on practice 
with it. And I just wanted to show here that it's at the level of just getting students to be aware of using proper language. Um, so the middle schoolers are learning artificial intelligence, generative, because that's an adjective that they may not yet know. And then of course, generative artificial intelligence, training data, algorithms, chatbots. This is these are this is the vocabulary for their first lesson. And so they are asked to speak think about this and learn about this equipped to discuss it properly. I don't have as long, um, let's say, of a presentation as the other participants, because I really was just kind of going to give a glimpse into some of this educational material that was put together. Um, and Marissa, I, I don't have the chat open, but you can drop the link into it. I think um, for my purposes, Part of what I'm thinking about um, touches on Steve, you saying, you know, the CBS Morning News reaction to the Kate Middleton image. Um, and I do have that image. I'll put it up on the screen in a sec, saying what's so wrong with the manipulation of this picture, right? And and teaching everyone, but in my case here, students to think about that question. Um, and it's probably in parallel, Michael, with you saying, you know, you kind of walked us through, and I saw the the comments were piling up in the chat saying like, um, is this a visual historical fiction? Um, and Michael, you took us toward mythology and painting and Picasso, and you culminated by saying AI is not photography. Um, and to me, the reason that you need to point that out is, many fold, right? One, you need to say it in part because a lot of AI can look like photography. So the statement needs to be made that it is not photography. And two, because we, and by we, I mean a kind of general public and particularly probably a general public that doesn't attend panels like this, where you're already critically engaged with it, a general public brings certain assumptions to a photograph or to things that look like a photograph, and there is an assumption of an evidentiary quality or an assumption that the visual that I am looking at is a record of something that really happened. And that's why I think this discussion and this education is so important. I was a little bit more from the middle school. And, and that's where I want to sort of take us towards this, um, which I'm sure everyone at this point sees this image and has probably also seen the various articles that zoomed in on daughter Charlotte's sweater to show us that Photoshop job. Um, you know, on the one hand, I think the question of what's so wrong with manipulating the picture, it can be a, a, a valid question, right? Like what's so wrong with someone wanting to slightly tweak or change or prettify their image? Um, and sometimes the answer is there's nothing wrong with that. I think, Steve, what you were getting at, what's wrong with it in this case is that the palace put it out as an official photo, that wire services distributed it as a news photo, which is why we saw AP and writers having to kill it because you can't put out an image that is manipulated because you undermine not just the credibility of what's going on in this one photo, but you start to undermine the credibility of photojournalism or the public's ability to trust in photos. And then you are in a, a dangerous space or maybe you're in a space like what Fred was gesturing towards earlier, Fred, when you said you had heard from a news colleague who said, maybe we won't even send people, we'll just put in some prompts, generate the images and it'll save us some money anyway. But then we don't have a record. We don't have a record of something evidentiary. We don't have a record of what is occurring. And I found it interesting um, that this Photoshopped image is, is being questioned as a Gen AI image, right? Is that really Kate Middleton at all? We haven't seen her in a few months. Maybe the whole thing is a generation. So I think we're into a space now, um, and I'm sure I'm saying what everybody knows, where people are really questioning the legitimacy of the image. And the final, this is my final screen, really, um, I just wanted to bring it back to this idea of disinformation. Um, and so on the one hand, so, you know, people can say, hey, it's just a mom with her three kids, and we've since found out she has cancer. 
give her a break. Like it's just a bad Photoshop job. And at the same time, that image being put out by the palace is part of a much, much larger landscape where there are political actors globally that are feeding disinformation campaigns in order to undermine trust in institutions, which is the kind of quote that I have pulled to the right side. So I, this is what I'm thinking about in terms of the role of Gen AI imagery in particular, um, which is also why I really appreciated Michael's statement of my work is not photography, but I also think it's incumbent upon us to think about if it's not photography, but looks like photography and can lead towards very serious consequences, right? If we go back to this idea of 2024 has more elections this year around the world than we've seen in many, many years, how do we handle this responsibly? So maybe I'll just leave us on a rhetorical question. No, and, and just to, to add to that, I think, you know, one way to think about photography is in terms of the subject. You know, if, if George Floyd is killed by the police and nobody believes the video, where does that leave? So it's often the most vulnerable people who then pay for this, you know, kind of sense of the poisoning the well, the fabrication. You don't know which picture happened, which didn't. And for those people in wealthier societies with perhaps less to worry about, it's more comfortable for people who are, you know, in, in very dire circumstances, it's essential that the picture be believed. And, you know, and looking at it from that frame, it, it's it's different. A friend of mine is, you know, fr from Russia, and, and he says there, nothing is true, but everything is possible. And I think, you know, we're putting ourselves pretty much in that frame where nothing is true anymore, everything is possible. You have to click through to cryptographically to see if the photograph has been changed. But then you have to worry about what Stephen was talking about. Was it set up in any case? And and that and, and finally, you just give up and you just say, I'm not looking anymore. It's just too much work. I'm just not going to do it. You know, to me, that, that that that's the way I see it at this point in terms of, you know, what, what we're looking at, uh, too. So, Stephen, since you were the first speaker, do you want to circle back and comment on the other presentations? Well, Do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure, Fred, thanks. And something you just said, uh, just this very moment said in terms of why bother, uh, you know, it's tiring. Uh, you know, I, I think I think perhaps one of the messages that got, that I didn't express as well as I, I meant to is that here, everybody who's attending this obviously has uh, some vested interest in the veracity of photography. That's terrific. Uh, I I think all of us have uh, an interest in veracity and media in general, and we all need to carry that cross. Uh, we can't give up. I'll, I'll and I'll give you two examples. It has nothing to do with photojournalism. It has to do with veracity. And I shared this the other night, uh, Glenn and Fred, when we spoke, and Michael, some years ago. Uh, a very well-meaning friend of mine on on social media had posted this this and I, I was trying to find it for the presentation because it would have made a point these this these ten points that uh, in theory Bill Gates made about uh, how teachers were great how elementary school teachers were great and it was this glowing like number. One, they love your kids. Number two, they love your kids more. Number three, they work for nothing. I mean, it was all these lovely accolades in terms of elementary school teachers. And of course, the, I see this on Facebook. My first reaction is, did Bill Gates really say this? So I look it up before I comment at all. I look it up. And of course, it's a hoax. Bill Gates never said this. Said this. So I go to my friend I don't publicly out her. I go on the back. I said, you know, uh, that's not, he didn't say this. And her response was, but you believe it, don't you? Meaning it didn't matter that Bill Gates said it or not. It, it, it you know, that helped her post. She wouldn't have posted it otherwise. But the fact was that I, I, I ran into a brick wall with this person because there was no way that I could describe to her without disenfranchising her that this was not an appropriate thing to post. 
It's a great thing. You posted 10 points, but you don't have to attribute it to somebody. So, so my point and the other point is, is that I've got an in-law who uh, is a very thoughtful, very uh, educated person who has totally given up on politics, totally given up on media because she doesn't believe anything she reads and she doesn't even want to deal with it. Now, I love the New York Times. The New York Times, as far as far as I'm concerned, is gospel, is the gospel, wrong word, is the newspaper, is my favorite media outlet across, always has been ever since I grew up. But that doesn't mean when I read something in it, I believe it 100%. I always check it out. I always check it out. And I assume most of the audience here checks it out, right? If you see something on the front page, did that really happen? I look in the Washington Post. I look in the Wall Street Journal to say, oh, did, what was that reporting? That we Just because we see something uh, visually as opposed to the written word, there's no difference there. And that's why I so admire, Fred, the, the organization that you're a part of now writing with light. Uh, and, and from an Adobe perspective, uh, yes, I work for the company that has created, uh, uh, was the initiator of the content authenticity initiative, and I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, I also work for the company, as Fred has pointed out, that is selling stock that is AI generated, created by prompts uh, regarding Gaza. Do I personally have an issue with that? Yeah, but at the same time, we don't sell news pictures. We are not an outlet for news pictures. And those pictures can be created in any way, shape, or form, whether it comes from Adobe or not. And we've created totally in parallel, totally having nothing to do with each other, the Content Authenticity Initiative. And by the way, there is no profit whatsoever in the Content Authentic Authenticity Initiative effort. So, uh, uh, it, which again, I'm exceedingly proud of. And I'm also very proud that uh, we've got a colleague like Lauren that is helping uh, build the education process around that. Uh, and lastly, I thought those images, I won't call them photographs that Michael showed were absolutely beautiful and stunning to look at. And somebody had put in the chat uh, a digital a visual a, a digital novelist or 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 a visual novelist or something like. I thought that was an appropriate description of what those images are. Uh, someone else also mentioned that they needed to be labeled AI. Well, they need to be they need to be attributed, just like any picture that is published anywhere needs to be attributed. Period. And if we have a technology that can help with that that attribution and the veracity all the better. And that's what the content authenticity initiative is about. Uh, I'll stop there because I can go on a lot longer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Michael, you, you prefaced your presentation by saying you've received a lot of criticism. Has any of that criticism made you change your mind about anything? Or, you know, if you would you have done it differently with all the criticism? Or are you 100% happy where, where you're at? Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it, it was, I was kind of surprised, you know, there wasn't actually more, more criticism. I think there was a lot, but I, um, um, I, yeah, I, yeah, you know, completely, I would do it again. In fact, I'm working on something now that might, will likely be, will likely get me canceled for the 10th time. So it's. You know the cancellations. I think are important if they're you know if they're done like in the you know in the right um, with with it's uh, you know a lot of the projects that I've worked on over the years have been very challenging and it's not challenging for the sake of you know challenging. It's like challenging to to sort of expand our understanding of like what what um, what we can do and um, maybe. Um, you know, some of that is okay, and and some of that is not okay. Clearly, I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I don't. You know, there are mistakes I'm making not because I, not because I'm trying to, you know, destroy the, the, <laughs> the field of photography, um, or, you know, it's not because um, it's not because I want attention. It's uh, I mean, if I wanted attention, I would I would show my face more on Instagram and post all the time, you know, you know, I do projects because I, because I, um, 
uh, because I really care about them. And in this case, it was, you know, at the beginning of last year, we were seeing a lot of, um, we were seeing a lot of, uh, we were seeing a lot of imagery that was even winning awards and uh, judges, highly capable judges with years of experience couldn't see that they weren't real images. And I think, uh, you know, for those of us who had used these, these AI tools enough, it was so clear that they weren't real pictures. Um, and that sort of uh, triggered me a realization that like, okay, well, we can criticize this, you know, this, this, this new medium um, as much as we want and we should, but we also need to like learn how it works and understand how it works and see what the possibilities are because otherwise we'll be judging contests and, you know, and like, Clearly, those are the least of our concerns. Uh, you know, as Fred pointed out, elections, um, everything under the sun is um, affected by this. And it's a, um, and so I think it's, uh, you know, and clearly coming from, you know, the history that I come from, I, I think that it's, uh, I think that there, there is a use case for this. And I think, um, and that may not be, you know, the 90 miles interpretation was, was very, um, you know, for me, it was kind of obvious because it was, um, it was like, uh, you know, along the lines of the kind of work that I make already photo essays and, you know, documentary, the way I'm using it now is much more, um, I think it's more exciting because it's, it's more unexpected. Like we can create imagery that, that, that not only does not exist, but we can create imagery that, that challenges our ideas, really important issues in the world um, that, that, that can't be photographed. And these are things that, that you know, visual artists of all, of all kinds have always you know, been able to do. And, you know, people like me who aren't, you know, uh, it, um, I understand technology a little bit, but I'm not like an expert. Um, and now the tech is good enough, and so I can make things, uh, make things that 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 okay, completely. Yeah, anyway, I'm rambling. Yeah, go ahead. Just to follow up with one quick question with you, and then we open sure. it to everybody here for questions. When we, you and I, were in Milan for the Photo of Vogue Festival, there was another project like yours from Australia using synthetic images, but in that case, they collaborated with the people to make sure they approve the images. You decided not to do that. Could you just explain why? And then we'll move on to questions. Yeah, well, um, one, I did, I mean, uh, the, the imagery you see is based on like what I've seen in the news and what I saw, you know, what I heard in Cuba, uh, just words I gathered and ideas that I gathered over the years that, you know, was based on true stories. So it's more like uh, um, they're they're you know I see them as like film clips from a from a movie, you know. Um, yeah, that answers it. So Victoria, do you want to ask your question? It's in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure who Victoria which rectangle you're in, but do you want to ask the question about the U.S. perspective? Well, why don't we just pose it, Fred? Uh, Victoria asked. Okay, so Victoria question. is asking the question, which is addressed to everybody. Do you think from the United States perspective only, and it's not a question just from uh, Michael, but uh, mm -hmm. there's Victoria. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. No, um, what question could I ask? Um, to be honest, is like, um, I saw a lot of your photos. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, whatever photos I saw, um, what I was just thinking, like, um, you had some photos which look like super fake, and why did you put them on? As knowing and seeing, probably with your photography eye, why would you put them on? As like same woman being dancing there and here um I, d I don't know like it's very cool to show people these type of photos 
but you're, you're talking about AI images or photos? Yeah, 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 AI, the AI images. images. Yeah, that's my question. I don't have any other question. Well, what, what do you mean by U.S. perspective then in your question? Oh, that, that was along the way before <laughs> some uh, like talks. <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe I shouldn't ask questions now. <laughs> I'm not the type of person to speak. I mean, I think what's interesting about Victoria's question, Victoria, maybe this isn't where you were necessarily going, but that the large language models, um, which are the kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of recruiting, right? It's how you scrape all the data that helps to inform what you will generate. Um, mm. It depends who is writing those algorithms. They are off, they are much better, um, as far as I know, in English, or at least that was true up until just a few months ago, if you're using text um, for image prompts. So there are a lot of biases built into these algorithms that are then generating images. Um, and it's not necessarily US only, but I think the question puts that to the onto the table in front of us, right? What are some of the biases that are built into some of these pro generative AI programs. Yep. Okay. Is there anybody else with a question? Well, it, it seems like the big uh, common comment out there is that such work needs to be labeled as synthetic or artificial intelligence. That, you know, we're not going to stop it, but we need to know what it is. And we need to really um, define a photograph and understand what a photograph is. And it's not what Michael did. It's, it's, it's beautiful work. It, it could be very um, helpful, but it's, it's not a photograph. Yeah, the, the problem with any of these things is social media has no rules. You know, there, there's people posting and they do whatever they want to do. They could say it's a photo when it's AI or say it's AI when it's a photo. Um, so I think what you're talking about is, you know, kind of the conventional media outlets should do a better job of it. You know, the Guardian, for example, sometimes calls AI images as photos when they're AI. You know, the, we don't really have the vocabulary at this point. The way, I mean, the one thing that I use now is I used to think photography used to be optical, you know, through the lens and then with computational photography, meaning the software in the camera, especially cell phones, Photoshop and so on, it became computational. So it got enhanced and often automatically enhanced. As we all know, with cell phones, it, you don't record what you see, you record the enhancement. And so we kind of got rid of the lens, you know, as being important. And now we got rid of the camera. With AI, you don't need a camera anymore. You could just do anything you want. You could have you know, Donald Trump dancing with Joan of Arc, there's no problem, you know, it'll do it for you. So we're in a different place at this point. And, and I think, you know, what Lauren's pointing out in the education is we have to be very, very careful to distinguish those different forms. And just one other thing though, almost every conversation we always point out, there've always been, um, you know, fakeries happening in the Soviet Union in the 19th century, you know, as, Stephen pointed out a number of them, but but the way I see it is there's so many every day that as a teacher and somebody who does a lot of these panels, I'm finding more and more, particularly young people, are just saying they never believe a photograph anymore. They, they're always skeptical of everything. They, they, they haven't grown up in a place where you could grow up, a time where you could believe the photograph. So that actually, you know, it's all, I, I did one at Arl at the photo festival and the AI artist, the young woman from Asia, was sitting next to me on the panel, and she just said, never has she believed a photograph ever since she was a child. So that, that generationally, different things are happening now at the same time, you know, to, to, to think about. So, you know, the, these are big, big issues. Any uh, more questions or thoughts? Well, if, you know, if I might add to that, Fred, you know, I, I worked for a tabloid for a couple of years behind the camera you know, in the 80s, uh, I would agree with somebody who said, I don't believe everything they see coming from my background. Uh, in the 80s, in Boston, where you are, uh, my competitor was the Boston Globe. Uh, they had uh, hand of God printing. Does anybody know what that term means? 
hand of God printing was when somebody like a Stan Grossfeld, holds the prize winner photographer, put a negative in the enlarger and burned down sections of the picture so dark, totally obscured it, made a completely new photograph and it was printed in the front page of the Boston Globe. I remember an exact example of that was a long shot of the Falmouth 10 kilometer race, Falmouth, Massachusetts, 10 kilometer race, a winding street through, through you know, woods and houses and stuff. They he burned down all the stuff that was outside of the roadway. So all you saw was this S of a road. Graphically, a beautiful image. It was on the front page of the Boston Globe. Guarantee you no newspaper today, no mainstream newspaper today would publish that picture because it was so heavily, heavily manipulated by hand of God printing. This was before Photoshop and Cytex. So, so this kind of stuff, I, and I also remember a boss at a previous uh, tabloid, I won't say which one, but I've only worked for one, who talked about uh, stumbling upon a, uh, a car accident uh, on Route 3 in Massachusetts because a teen had, uh, was drinking and uh, there was a six a, a can of a beers in the roadway. And he had no problem in kicking the cans of beers closer to the car and making the picture. True story. So, so there's no technology and there's no trust. And there was no way to be able to say that that picture that ended up on the front or wherever it was, was true or not. We're just now because of this becoming so much more aware of this. And the reason why I put the Gutenberg Bible on the front of my presentation was because that was a technology pivotal point in information transmission. And that's exactly where we are today with AI. And, and the imagery that is collect, collected with cameras and people who are not, who historically weren't normal photographers, weren't regular photographers, weren't, weren't, weren't photojournalists. So from an education perspective and where tech can help, we need to apply those things with, with, with all full verve to ensure that we're creating an audience as best as we can of, of educated consumers of information, whether it's the written word, whether it's an image, whether it's a, you know, a moving image or whatever. There's, and, and everything needs to be cited appropriately. If you believe everything you see on Facebook, God bless you. If you believe everything you see on Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever Trump is doing, okay, fine. But I believe stuff that I take the time to check out and to ensure that it's, this, it's appropriately sourced. Lastly, and I, I promise I'll shut up, I work in high ed uh, uh, in, in Adobe. And one of the things that all edu many educators in higher education use is plagiarism detection detectors, right? If you've worked in high ed, higher ed, you are familiar with these. There's a product called Turn It In. But many educators are, are walking away from it. Why? Because it's only 80% effective. It can't detect 100% of, of stuff that's plagiarized. So why bother at all? You, not, you must trust as an educator, the source who's submitting the content, a term paper or, or whatever. You got to. Or you have to have you have to have a human way of checking it out. Otherwise, same with photography today. It's just getting a little bit more complex. Uh, Michael, in the chat, there's something directed to you from Tara Pixley. Tara, do you want to ask the question yourself, or should I read it? Um, I'm happy to ask the question myself. Go, so, go uh, thank you all for having this um, webinar. This is super interesting, and a lot of different viewpoints here. Michael, it would be really helpful for you to share an example of a phrase that you use to result in these images from Midjourney. You'd mentioned that words like beautiful didn't result in the kind of, uh, you know, sort of objective view that you were looking for or that, or, and you, or you said that you wanted to move towards more objective terms and that resulted in better images. So I'm really curious what kinds of prompts you gave Midjourney because the images across your series seem to depict Cubans as primarily black and brown people. However, the U.S. Census indicates, and personal experience from I'm from Florida, uh, the majority of Cuban Americans and Cuban immigrants are white. So I'm curious how you came to these images and how the AI interpreted 
those prompts such that it resulted in such racially inaccurate representations of Cuban immigrants. Michael, I think you're muted. Um, so for one, clearly when I make, you know, as a white American male, um, much of what I do can be seen as being highly problematic. That goes without saying. Um, you, one of the phrase you use is racially inaccurate, which I think if you look at a lot of this imagery, you will see light skinned people. So, so I'm curious, like, um, for example, go onto my website and you can see every single image that I showed here today. And you'll see a lot of people who are not just black and brown. So, so that's problematic, you know, saying that um, this imagery is racially problematic. That's problematic for me, and it's not true when you look at the when you look at the imagery. Um, but that said, of course, yeah, there's 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 a lot of problems with the with the pictures, um, and that is, you know, when I did this, um, there was an opportunity of like using my own imagery in the training, um, in the generative AI training. And so they would look more like my photos and I would have more control over them, but I chose to use the mid journey algorithm because, um, because it gave me the most, you know, the most options for, for creating imagery, um, exact like phrases of, uh, the prompts that I used in making this imagery. I can't remember off the top of my head, but generally I start very simple. So if it's like a scene of the ocean, I'll say um, a, a, a raft, a handmade raft that is adrift in the sea in a storm in the Florida Strait, full of Cubans, full of, um, I mean, I used South Americans, I used Europeans. Sometimes I used a combination of those words. And so I could get um, a racial uh, diversity as far as the look of, you know, the, this, you know, the look of the imagery. But I am curious, like, which, which imagery is racially inaccurate? Um, I'm very curious exactly which, which um, which imagery you're, you're referring to. But I think, um, you know, a lot of times, again, it starts out very simple. It'll be like one sentence. And then just in the prompting, you're giving choices where you can choose which images um, you like over others. And a lot of times the AI, well, the AI over time learns through your selection, which is your curation the kind of imagery you prefer. And a lot of times it just gives you um, new imagery that, 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 even of exp uh, that you had no prompts for, just randomly. So like one of the prompts that you can use in Mid Journey is called chaos. And there's like a scale of one through a hundred, I think it is, and the higher it is, the more, the more chaos you you can get in your prompting. And so the more variety um, you will have as far as like, uh, you know, the composition, the content. Um, and so, so it's very much, um, you know, so a lot of these results aren't really the, you know, they started with like very simple words and I used very simple words and very short sentences. And so I could, sort of maximize the possibilities. And then over time I would advert, you know, I would, you know, I would add a word or add a, you know, another phrase. And 
with a result that I liked, and then I would reprompt for that, if that makes any sense. So Ted Ostrowski on the chat said, so we are, are we discussing that the fake is inaccurate? Ted, do you want to talk about that a bit? Or is, <laughs> every time I pull up somebody's... Uh, can, I, can I ask something? Sorry, uh, I jumped into the whole thing and I saw someone was representing like Second World War photo and whatever. And I was just thinking like as a traveler in the world and if someone would um, show images from certain place where you haven't spent time um, and, not, and, not, and not knowing like how people look like, it's kind of like, what the heck? Like, I don't know, like if someone would all of a sudden make um thing from vietnam war on ai as i think and not being in vietnam for example for me or like second world war which is like my deepest thing what i've been doing and collecting photos from all those times it's just like you have to know what you're doing that's, I don't know what the girl previously said um, about the skin colors and things, but it's like when you're creating certain things on AI, from my perspective, like let's say I'm living in Vietnam, I'm now in Europe, but like I know Vietnam, I love Vietnam, but if I would make certain like process of uh, American war being established in Vietnam. I know exactly how it would look like in the sense of skin color, people's looks and whatever. I would make sure how these people would think about it. I don't know. Uh, Victoria, let, let's move on. I think we've got to bring this to a close. It's um, well after nine o'clock and we're hoping to wrap up around now. But, but thank you for those comments. No, I think the point you're making is a good one. Uh, the entire history can be re redone and rethought and re you know, revisioned in, you know, by all kinds of people. And in fact, that's what's happening. So, so Glenn, we're finishing up, I assume? Is yeah, that... yeah. Um, we're a little bit over, which is fine. But I, I think we should wrap up now. And thank you, Fred. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for everybody for being here tonight and want to applaud everybody. Um, this will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, in a few days if you like to see a recording of it and keep an eye out for all of our other programs during the uh, rest of the SDN Visual Storytelling Festival. So really, I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yes. Thank you, Fred. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. It was really an important discussion and consideration. Thank you, all the panelists. And just scratching the surface. <laughs> There's a lot more to discuss. Yeah, someone, someone said we needed a part two. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll start that at 11 p.m., OK? Oh, oh, yeah, I'm right on that, Glenn. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks to the panelists. Take care.